In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA 097. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. What's your drink? Tell me. So, my drink is called Carcada. All right, you can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Because I did such a great job pronouncing it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Doom to Fail, the podcast where Taylor uplifts and I do whatever the opposite of that is. My name is Fars. <laughs> I'm joined here by my co host, Taylor. Hi, Taylor. Hello. How are you? Groggy. Yeah. I sound it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like two hours ahead of your time, and I'm still groggy. And I That's don't chase fair. kids, and I'm still having a hard time. Yeah, yeah. it's Saturday. Um, you're joining us from lovely, lovely Joshua Tree that is currently raining. Is that right? Yeah, it is. We had tons of snow this week as well. Um, we had a couple inches that stayed on the ground for a while, so it's been wild. That's incredible. I love talking about the weather, and it's been wild. So. Yeah, but wait, look, we're at that age where talking about the weather is kind of all we got. No, totally. I want to hear about it. Tell me what's going on outside. Look out your window. Just Give me a play by play. I want to know. It's overcast. I'm looking out right now. It's overcast. It's a little, <laughs> it's a little bit chilly, um, but it's supposed to be um, pretty good weather later on here in Austin. I'm going to take Luna for a nice little hike and just it's going to be an out, outside day, I think. Very nice. I'm going to Dallas next week. So I know that's far away from you, but I will be in Texas. Maybe I'll be there the because I haven't, I haven't been to Dallas in long, enough time where my parents are complaining about it. So maybe I'll join you there and we can grab dinner. Yay. Let me, let, awesome. me, let me admonish my dog for a second. Okay. I'm back. Uh, Taylor, Ooh. what is going to be your drink for today's episode? Um, well, I am, shockingly, going back to Russia. I don't even drink that much vodka. <laughs> any, really. Like, I feel like I have never have, like, have vodka at home. But I'm going to try vodka again. But I'll tell you about it in a second. But first, tell me your drink, and then I'll go into my story. Well, do you have a brand that you like? No, oh, and I feel like, I don't know, don't people like Tito's? Isn't that like yeah, the in on trend right now? It is Austin based, so that well, would Well, then great. Sense. That's what I'm going with. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, my drink, I actually don't really totally know how to pronounce this. I'm going to try. It looks like it's pronounced Karkada. Karkada. How, how, do you, how do you spell it? K A R K A D E H. And oh it this my story involves an Egyptian man, Ooh. which is why I went to Egypt to find a traditional drink there. It is made from boiling dried red hibiscus flowers with water. Then you chill it, then you add sugar to it. Cool. So it actually sounds really good. I think Starbucks kind of makes something like this. It, yeah, it looks like a Starbucks drink. It's like, I'm looking at it now, it's like a deep red yeah. iced tea. Yeah, yeah. exactly, okay. exactly. So um, I'll uh, go into details of why I picked any, you know, who this person is and the connection to Egypt later on. Cool. But that's my drink for the day. It's not alcoholic, unlike your penchant for just drinking straight vodka. Someday at, I will buy vodka. In the morning. <laughs> I'll remember, and maybe next week. Next week I won't go to Russia, but I will drink vodka anyway. Um, I'll just be like taking shots of vodka and like sleep all day. My husband, my family would love that. They'd be real proud of me. Um, so far as we're going back to Russia again. And I know we've gone to Russia like a million times so far in this podcast. And I'm trying to think about like, why do I talk about it so much? <laughs> like, what is my current problem? And I think it's because so many good stories that come out of Russia, so much tragedy, so much grander. Um, there's just like a lot. And it's so interesting because it's so isolated and it's cold. And like, I'm just thinking about like the idea of being in Russia. And there's this woman that I really like. She was the editor of Vogue in the 1960s. Her name's Diana Vreeland. She's like another like really like over the top personality. She like smoked cigarettes all the time and like was like, wow, like very, just very funny. She was from Paris. Um, and I mean, I'm making like, I'm moving my arms like you know a what I mean. lot of hand waving so, going on. yeah a lot of hand waving so she was great and then there's a documentary about her called the eye has to travel and in that documentary angelica houston is talking about her and she's like 
Diana was like, why worry about this and this when there's Russia? Like, Russia really big. And I feel like that's how I feel about it, even though, like, I'm not super stoked about the current state of Russia, but it's like a, a I don't know how to explain it. Does that kind of make sense? Why it's fascinating? It is fascinating. I mean, I mean their, their history's incredible. Everything, yeah, it, the art's fantastic. They have Fabergé eggs. Nobody else does Fabergé eggs. Yes, exactly. I feel like that's, that's I get good. You, yes, Fabergé eggs. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Um, so today, the couple I'm going to talk about um, is a couple that Marcus Parks from last podcast on the left called one of the most tragic love stories of all time because they were thrust into something they weren't prepared for. And like, yes, that's true. But you are also the company you keep. And they kept company with Rasputin. Yes, I knew it. <laughs> the second you so, brought up Marcus Parks, I was like, yep, yep, I know where yep. you're going. So we're talking about the last emperor of Russia, Tsar Nicholas, and his wife, Alexandra. So some of the sources, um, I watched this amazing made-for-TV movie called Rasputin, Dark Servant of Destiny, and Alan Rickman plays him. Great it casting. Is, unbelievable so i took i was like taking pictures literally of my screen to send them to my husband because it's so funny and then google photos made me this like really like stylized collage of just pictures of alan rickman as rasputin it's hilarious so i'll put it on our instagram but he does a great job it's everything that you could ever imagine an alan rickman performance to be um ian mckellen plays our nicholas it's great so highly recommend i watched it on youtube uh, i also listened to last podcast whole series on Rasputin and, and read a little bit of a book that I wanted to read more of, but 25 hours long. I didn't have 25 hours to listen to it, um, but called about Rasputin as well. So I'll put that in the notes. My, my, favorite, really talk my favorite part of the Rasputin series was when the guards had a scale for how mm -hmm. drunk he was. Yes. Drunk, very drunk, totally overcome with drink. And then, uh, Ben Kissel at the end goes, they left one off, which is, oh, I, I, I'm just drunk enough to be good to drive right now. <laughs> right. Exactly. He was very drunk most of the time in this story. But I also don't want to talk about him as much as I want to talk about Alex and, and Nicholas, because let's talk about like their relationship, but also like Rasputin obviously played a big part of it. So some of the characters that we're going to meet. So Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov. It was born in 1868. His father was in line to be emperor. And when his grandfather was assassinated, um, he became heir to the throne. So he was pretty word worldly. He traveled around Europe, meeting with other royal families and Queen Victoria. So it sounds like he loved like the rich part of being heir to the throne and the traveling and all of that. But he wasn't really thinking about the ruling part or like actual politics. He was more like, this is fun, I'm having a good time. And hadn't really thought through when he was going to actually be in charge. His wife, Alexandra, was born Princess Alex of Hesse, of Hesse by the Rhine in 1872. She came from Germany, but she was also Queen Victoria's granddaughter. So a lot of this is like, they're not related, but like everyone's related. You know what I yeah. mean? It's like a small, a small pool. Have you seen The Kingman? The Kingman. Yeah, it's on Netflix. Um, Ray, Ray Fiennes is in it. Oh, yes, but I have. It's all about this part of world history and how, like, those three, the German guy, um, the uh, Nicholas, and mm -hmm. then the guy in the UK, or the yes. King, George, you, you talked about him yes. already before, but they mm -hmm. were all, like, they were raised together. Like, they were, like, all, they, yeah, they were cousins. Like, they were, like, very close to each other. It's very, it's an interesting uh, dynamic they had. Yeah, exactly. So, it was, like, the small pool of, like, royalty all over Europe and Russia and everywhere. Um, so, Alex, Alexandra was called Alex, and she seemed to be like a lovely child, but she was very shy and very introverted. And then um, diphtheria came through, you know, the palace, and she lost a sister and her mother, and she became like really brooding, like a very like melancholy child. She was very shy, very religious. So her being very religious plays a lot into this because she believes a lot of weird shit because she's very religious. And people saw her as like maybe a little bit haughty, but really she was just super shy. So they met at a wedding um, of her sister to someone in Russia. And um, he, Nicholas was interested in her. She was 12, he was 16. And she was like, 
whatever, they didn't get married right away. And four years later, they ended up getting married. One of the reasons that she didn't want to was because she really didn't want to convert from being Lutheran to being Russian Orthodox, but ultimately she does. So she does end up converting, but and stays very religious. So similar to Catherine the Great, she you know became Russian Orthodox kind of right away when she got there. Um, also, like political reasons, people wanted them to get married, and they did love each other. So all accounts, they loved each other. You know, they had like a good you know connection. They spoke in English, which I think is is funny. Like after you know living in Russia, they didn't really speak Russian in the court. They they spoke in English to each other. And Alexandra goes to Russia, and right before their wedding, the current czar dies, and Nicholas becomes becomes the the emperor of Russia. He was not ready, and he said when he found out his dad had passed, he said, "What is going to happen to me and all of Russia?" So just like not, ready not, a, at all. not, a, not a good sign. No, and he was not like a baby. He was twenty six. You know, so you should be prepared to take yeah. this job. Like, I'm sure, like, um, what's his face? Charles, King Charles has been preparing to be king forever, even though he didn't get that job until he was like 80, you know, but at least, you know, he was thinking about it for a long time. Yeah. So totally. he, sh he should have been more ready, but he wasn't. Another thing that is like super contradictory to that, because like he should have been more ready to be czar. He wasn't, but he like firmly believes that God made him czar. Like a hundred percent. Like he believes that like God put him there and everything that he says is like has to go because it's what God wanted. And we talk about that, I think, before and other things as well. So like if you like it kind of goes hand in hand with the like any monarchy is that assumption that you're that much better than everybody else. Yeah, exactly. So that just like makes you a weird person, <laughs> you know. Um, Taylor, is that a is that a is that a gray nation builder shirt or a black oh, one that you yeah. wash the shit out of? It's gray. Okay. It's always gray. All my black ones are gray now. That's why. Oh no, it's just, it, it, was, it was always gray. But I do wear I do rock this station. But this is the only nation builder shirt I think I still have. Nice. But I like it because it's warm. Um, and because it's cold. So there you go. So Tsar Nicholas is from Catherine the Great's line, and if you'll remember from episode one, Catherine the Great was great, and her son Paul was not. He was the dope. And one thing that Paul did was rechange the laws so that women couldn't be emperor, and that directly ties into our story as well later. And so we'll talk about that. And even though it was 150 years before that, it still plays a direct role. So I've got some background and some think about kind of the time that we're in right now. So he becomes a czar in 1896. And I don't know if you've seen pictures of, of Nicholas, but he has an amazing mustache. I don't know if that like matters, but it's like a wonderfully curled up mustache. He becomes czar. 1896, they get married. In 1904, there's a revolution. And it's more than just like, it's very complicated, but it's a revolution. There's a thing called Bloody Sunday where people are like revolting, people are starving. They want, you know, more, they need help, they need jobs, they need all these things. And um, the there's like some orders and a lot of people die and it's, you know, a pretty um, like turning point. There's a, there's a revolution in 1905 and Nicholas ends up giving up part of his power to a legislative body called the Duma. So he's already yeah. kind of half Taylor, given up. Can I cut you off real power. quick? Yeah. Here, look at, look, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Okay. I'm excited. Uh, how do I do the whole desktop? This is the silent interactive part. Oh my God, it's so funny. Mars is showing me how, <laughs> how Zar Nicholas looks just like Jack Dorsey. <laughs> They're oh like my God, how did he get there? Right? He really does. That is terrifying. For those that don't, Jack Dorsey is the um was the CEO and founder of uh Twitter and Square, <laughs> but he looks <laughs> identical to the. Oh team. my gosh, it's so amazing. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> no, I think that that is some that's important for everybody to know. Wow. There we go. Wow. There we have it. Both have global implications for their jobs and leaving their jobs. Yeah, <laughs> so. no kidding. Lots of similarities. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, thank you for sharing. That was totally worth it. So yeah, now you know what he looks like. So he looks like Jack Dorsey with a gilded military outfit on. Um, so there's also, speaking of the military, this is, there's a Russo-Japanese war happening. Sometimes Nicholas goes out with his troops, but it's just like a long game plan. He just like kind of doesn't really know what he's doing right now. 
So we're also in a very heavy time with like occult things. So first, would you, would you have you ever gone to a seance? Would you go to a seance? Yeah, I would totally go to a seance. I have not gone to a seance, but I would. I don't know if I would. I think I'd be too scared. Like I would really want to, but I think in the moment I'd be like really, really scared. I mean, I, I, I see know. why you would be, but I'm so, it's an Austin thing of like get, getting into like spirituality in weird ways, I think. And okay. Yeah. I think that's where the appeal would be for me. How many crystals are you wearing right now? I'm wearing one tiger's eye necklace, <laughs> <laughs> some lava rock beads, and then I another bead that I don't know what it's made of, but it's, it's good looking. All right. Well, those seem to be working well for you. Okay. yes um but this is also a very heavy like time of it's like it's the occult it's like i don't know if you listened to the last podcast about madame blavatsky or like have like, um it's like people who are like oh i i can communicate with the dead like come over we'll have a seance things like that and obviously a lot of it's like well most of it is probably all sham but you know there's a lot of that happening and the rich people fucking love it because of course they do they love going yeah. to these things um so it's relevant to our story because rasputin is also in this so one thing that um have you ever watched american horror story you like yes that? absolutely do you know the did you watch roanoke yeah so roanoke's my favorite season and remember the part where like in the first part of it when the wife is at home alone and it starts raining teeth and yeah. then her husband comes home and he's like you need to calm down so at that time my husband and i made a deal that if i say something to him like Juan it was raining teeth while you were gone. He will believe me and we will move because that is something that like, you just don't make up, you know? So we're like, okay, let's believe each other. If I'm like the chairs in the kitchen rearrange themselves on their own, like, believe me, don't gaslight me into thinking that I'm crazy. So that's our deal. But also I think an exception to that is if one of us comes home and says, hey babe, I just met a wizard. He's gonna solve all of our problems. We should step back and say, no, you did not. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Pretty, pretty simple rule. Yeah. So Rasputin is, I mean, imagine him being a wizard. He was born in Siberia in, in 1869. There's some great resources on him. Watch that movie with Alan Rickman. It's so good. Um, but some of the like fun things about him are, I always think of him as so such an ancient being, you know, but he's not. There's pictures of him. You know, he's, you know, he, he died in 1900s, not like he's an ancient mystic but he feels kind of ancient you know what i mean and, well, it was just good branding yes exactly it was exactly good branding and we'll talk about why like his so another t just timeline thing like he had a, kids and his daughter lived until 1977 so it's like there's you know she wrote a, a memoir about him that i didn't get to read but i would love to read someday um he lives in siberia which is terrible you know it's just cold and awful and he has a family and he ends up you know being like you know kind of the town drunk but i feel like everyone's drunk because you're cold yeah. and he takes these like big pilgrimages walking across russia in the name of god like abandoning his family um doing all these weird things but it's also important to remember he's never directly in the church he's just like around he just like wears robes and like hangs out he's never like actually a part of the church and he ends up making friends with these sisters who are called the Black Crows, who seem really cool. They're like also like, you know, mystical occult people, but they're just like rich people having fun in St. Petersburg. And he, you know, starts to be introduced to like some more rich people. And that's the way he gets eventually introduced to the emperor. He is a weird guy. So it's like his personality is to be like eccentric. He comes in and he kisses people and he hugs people and he does a lot of like touchy things. He'll talk to you and then he'll like start like blurring his words and then like come back and then he'll like turn and talk to someone else and then he'll like do something else. So it makes him kind of like mysterious and enchanting. And he like does this like hilarious thing that he like convinces people that in order to be forgiven, they have to sin. So he like, that's how he gets a lot of people to sleep with him, you know, things like that, <laughs> which is like, sure i feel like uh from everything i've read about rasputin he he created that persona mm -hmm. like that mannerism that you're talking about which i've read a lot about it feels mm -hmm. like that was manufactured and actually not who he was who he was at his core was the village drunk 
but yeah. he wanted greater than that. And then he's like, mm-hmm. what do I do? He's like, okay, I got to walk a certain way. Like, I got to have the right swag. I got to have the right voice, the right, like all that shit. Right. Exactly. To like be appealing to these people, to right, the people exactly. who like, want something to happen. Like the reason that like the occult is so popular is like these rich people want something to happen. So they're like looking for it. So they see that in him. Exactly. Um, he, has these piercing blue eyes and everybody's like, oh my God, his eyes. And I just also wanted to state for the record that your eyes are not a window to your soul. That's dumb. That's not true. And that he just had blue eyes that are probably very watery. <laughs> and people were like, ooh, they're sparkly. Eyes don't sparkle. Just eyes. So, I don't know, Taylor. I don't agree with you. No, they're not. It's not, it's not it's magical about people's eyes. Just eyes. They're just like gross organs, wet organs that you can see from your head. You have, you have a weird take on eyes. I don't know where this <laughs> hatred comes from, but run with I just it. think that they they get too much. They get too much good publicity that they don't deserve. I mean, All like right. I'm grateful for them, but it's not a window to your soul. Okay, we'll um, agree to disagree. Okay, great. Agree to disagree. Um, <laughs> so people are entranced by him, um, and I love the idea of like you know going to rooms, seeing this weird, you know, guy and everybody being like, this is the guy. But I feel like personally, I'd be pretty uncomfortable if I saw him and I'd be like, what is this? And I feel like nowadays I could probably walk a place and find like a dude with a bunch of crystals who's like, hey, like blah, 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 blah. But like, I'm a little skeptical of that. But it'd be fun just to like give yourself into being like, this is a, a magic mystical guy. You know what I mean? So you don't find my, um, this, this tiger eye necklace magical or whimsical at all? No. Well, I find you whimsical, but not the necklace. Okay, it's not because right. not because of the necklace. There we that, go. Okay, that makes right, sense. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, but it's also like I don't blame people for falling for this or like being entranced by it. It's like when you meet like Bill Clinton and people are like, "You're the only person in the room when he talks to you," which is true because that's his job. The kid understands how to talk to people, so that's kind of what Respian is doing. Um, I also was thinking, and I'm curious, like I don't feel like I hear this about women very much. That like idea that like. It just entranced everybody. So I want to learn more about that. So if anyone has stories of that, please let me know. Um, but he ends up, Rasputin ends up being introduced to Alexander Nicholas, and they love him. They love that he's mysterious. They call him our friend. He hangs out with them all the time. Um, he promises to like do magical things for them. There's an awesome scene in the Alan Rickman movie where he like, meets Alexander for the first time, and he's like, Mama, Papa, blah, blah, blah. He calls them Mama and Papa. He's like always on the floor. Real weird, but they love it. And back to the czars and that line that we talked about where um, Catherine the Great's son, Paul, said that women cannot be the, be the emperor. They have four daughters, which we've learned before is gross. No one wants daughters. So they have to have a son. So Alexander and Nicholas finally have a son. His name is Alexei, and he is super sick. He's a hemophiliac. And this comes directly from Queen Victoria. She's a hemophiliac and put, brought that into the line. So then like, Alexandra ha- carries the gene and then her son has it. So basically, if he gets like bruised, he can die of internal bleeding. And he's like always in pain. So he's just, like this little sickly little child. And somehow Rasputin does actually help Alexei in like some way that like is don't really understand. They're, they talk about it in last podcast. It's like in a lot of the books, like he did potentially make him feel better and maybe a lot of it's like psychosomatic like having this wizard over you makes you feel better um but one story that is kind of crazy he used to heal him like over telegram if he was like near death he would send a telegram to the family and be like he will be fine blah blah blah. well one one thing i remember from that was he would tell the doctors to stay away from him Mm -hmm. because they would keep giving him aspirin at the time they didn't realize that aspirin was a blood thinner which is the worst thing you give to somebody who's a hemophiliac yeah, totally, totally. Which I think is that sounds true, but like, how would the rest of you know that? Did he? Like, what? Well, That's one of the one of the, fun. one of the other things I read was that um, he had nurses there who would intentionally mm. get him sick or make him feel mm. worse, so mm-hmm. that he could come in and be this wizard who fixes him. I would totally believe that too. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Totally makes sense. Yeah, and so for her for better or worse or however it happened he did like seem to heal the boy enough so that they were like really beholden to him and like really needed rescue in around but they also didn't tell anybody that the boy was sick so they were spending all this time with rescue and, and people most people around them were like what the hell is going on 
Like, is it a sex thing? Like, what does he have over you? Like, what is this? Is he having an affair with the empress, which like he was not, he's, you know, sleeping with a lot of people, but not her. And he's like this like weird drunk guy around all the time and all these things. But I think people would have maybe understood if they were like, we think he heals our son, but they didn't tell anybody that. They didn't tell anybody that Alexei was a hemophiliac. So that's um, kind of making a, everything worse. There was a reason for that. I don't remember what it was, but it was something around how they couldn't let the next, because I think that at that time, Nicholas thought that his grip on the monarchy was tenuous anyways. Yeah. And he also thought that if he said that the next in line was a sickly child, it would have made it even worse. Because I think the Duma was trying to convert to a yeah. constitutional monarchy at that time, or a, a, um, whatever you'd call it. Yeah, no, but, that's right. Like, like, like the UK. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly right. So they, if they would have known, you know, maybe people have been more sympathetic, but he was definitely like, this is, I have a very like loose grip on this anyway. I can't let people know this. You know, there's a lot more about Rasputin, but he's starting to put his friends into power. It's just like, again, like a better emperor would have had better advisors than Rasputin and Rasputin's friends. So a lot of it is like, if you're in charge of something like a country or a company or anything, like you need to hire the right people and they were not hiring the right people at this point. So a lot of people, long story short, a lot of people are mad at Rasputin and think he's a weirdo. So on December 29th, 1916, a group of people decide to assassinate Rasputin and it's a whole deal. So they end up um, bringing him over and giving him cyanide laced cake and wine. And Rasputin just like, does not die, um, probably because he's an alcoholic and his veins and stomach is lined with vodka. So like, well, that happened before too. They also thought part of it was, um, I'm going off the last podcast memory here, but Rasputin was stabbed in the stomach at one point in mm -hmm. his life. Yes. And they mm -hmm. had to cut out a bunch of his intestines to like make him whole again or healthy. And uh -huh. they also assumed that because of that, because the cyanide didn't wasn't able to travel through and digest and absorb through his intestines completely like a normal person, that's probably mm -hmm. what saved them. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. That totally makes sense. Because he definitely like ingested a lot of cyanide and did not die like they expected him to. And um, eventually they end up shooting him in the head and dumping him in a river after all after all this. So Rasputin dies. And it's already a very tumultuous time in the palace. And so um uh, Alexandra and Nicholas are sort of like resigned to it. They're like, okay, like they're trying to figure out what to do, what to do next. So essentially, like there were a lot of problems in Russia. We had all these revolutions, all these wars. A better emperor, a different emperor could have, you know, navigated World War One better. He could have, um, you know, helped his people more, but he, you know, was not able to Nicholas was not able to effectively address these problems. And the government was seen as corrupt and ineffective, you know, because of a lot of reasons, but that, you know, became the whole impetus for the whole revolution. And he is in 1917, um, he is like taken from the throne and the family is brought to Siberia to live in exile. So the girls, sick Alexei, Alexander Nicholas are kind of taken prisoner and the Bolsheviks become in charge and the, emperor line of Russia is over. So now um, he's the last of, of the Russian emperors. Maybe he could have done a better job. He didn't really want to. He relied a lot on, on Alexandra, who also didn't know how to rule. They were both kind of like living their life. They were very concerned about their son. They were concerned about religion. They were concerned about mysticism. They were trying to like live this life that wasn't compatible with the time because the time was like a really revolutionary time and things were going to change no matter what. So if they would have done the like maybe they could have done the constitutional monarchy and there could have still been an emperor like they have in the UK with the queen and the king or whatever, but they didn't. And they ended up you know, in this place in, in, in Siberia and it ends for um, Alexandra and Nicholas in a really terrible way. Um, they are in this uh, place in Siberia in exile, and then they're brought to the basement on July 16th, 1918. The whole family, um, along with some other, you know, uh, of their of their friends, are brought to the basement, and they are shot to death um, by a couple people just shooting into the crowd of people in this basement. So they're trapped in this basement. They're shot. It, it sounds awful. They actually do it in the Ellen Rickman movie. They do it in like a very like slow motion, chaotic way. Um, but the parents, um, Alexandra and Nicholas, die right away. The girls, which is, this is also terrible, um, 
don't die right away because they had like jewels and gold sewn into their dress that they had like taken from the palace and that kind of acted as a bulletproof vest for them. So they didn't die right away. They were just like injured and they ended up like being stabbed or shot at close range to die. So all of the Romanovs are killed in the basement. They put them in the back of a a like cart to take them away to bury them. And then like the guys driving the cart are also drunk. Everyone's tired. No one wants to do it. So they just kind of bury them in a field. And they ended up finding their their bones like pretty recently and identifying like who they were. But um that's how they ended. So they started off as like, you know, heirs to a really great empire and coming from these really rich families and they ended up being, you know, shot in in a basement and buried in a field. Um, so one thing that I remember, cause again, I, this is one of those rare topics that you bring up that I actually know a lot about. I love it. Please tell me more. It's so interesting to me. They, the way they struck me forever was this is just a, um, married parent couple. The, right. No, no part of the story when, as I read it, listened to it, understood it was you're you're dealing with these uber powerful people who like understand the gravity of what their responsibilities mm -hmm. should be they were lit all of this was because of alexi all of it like yeah. rasputin's involvement the way that everybody felt around the two of them was mm -hmm. all tied to alexi because again nobody knew what was going on with right. them except the parents so right so there was no trust in in them and in their government and like yeah you're right they they seem like just like they seem like just people they don't seem like an emperor yeah 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 and, and i think like that's the for me the the doomed to fail part of all this is that i don't know what you do if you're them because it's just not in their character to be these people but i don't know if it's not then maybe you just don't maybe you abdicate i don't know yeah i think that you you know you surround yourself with smart people and people who are smarter and people who know what they're doing. So it's not like he became emperor and there was no one to help. There are people who had been like aides to his father and his grandfather forever. So they could have like continued to help him, but he was just like a little bit like, well, I mean, everything I say is right because God made me in charge like Henry VIII did. So I'm going to do these things that maybe aren't advised correctly it's like you should have people around you who are super super smart and really really good at their job but instead they like had Rasputin around because they were afraid their son was going to die and they like invited his friends around and it became like a I don't know like a group of people who didn't weren't weren't qualified for the job yeah yeah you know so it's unfortunate it is unfortunate. it's not a fun it's not a fun story I think that Rasputin adds this element of like comedy to everything mm-hmm mm -hmm. But it's just generally like a sad, awful, especially the way they died in that basement with their kids yeah. all next to them. The other unfortunate part of it is that it ushered in uh, Lenin. And, mm -hmm. then it, and then it ushered in beyond that Stalin. Like all the downstream horrible effects were yes. because of, frankly, Nicholas's lack of leadership. Exactly. Because of this poor leadership and because they were not you know, at all prepared. And then, you know, all these things happen and then we get to you know, where we are today. Yeah. So fun times. Very, very fun. I, I recommend anybody who is interested in this, go listen to the last podcast on the left episode. So I, I think it's, it might be five parts or four. I can't remember. I mean, um, it's, it's four. Yeah. But it's based on their focus was Rasputin. But again, mm -hmm. he's the critical figure in this country at that time. Yeah. They said, they said something in that that I thought was really interesting, which was like, if you because like I just said, if you didn't have Rasputin, then you wouldn't have had Tsar Nicholas over run over by the Bolsheviks, which means you don't have Lenin, which means you don't have Stalin, mm -hmm. which means you don't have the allied powers of World War. What they said was really interesting was Rasputin was weirdly one of the most consequential humans mm -hmm. that has ever existed because all the downstream yeah. impacts of it, you probably don't even have the 2016 election because you don't have someone like Putin who is a KGB officer and Stalin. Like, Right, you don't have like Russia on Facebook. Yeah. yeah, and I think yeah, and he he was just like a a peasant from Siberia who wanted to do something exciting. So he was like, "Let me go for a walk and see what happens." You know. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Pick, pick your friends wisely. Um, exactly. Well, thank you for that, Taylor. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm really glad. I, 
yeah i'm really glad you covered that one that was it's such an interesting story so i'm gonna segue us into the true crime side of our doom to fail stories so my story this week elicits a lot of feelings for me um okay for one it starts as a story i can totally resonate with if it wasn't clear by my name already to folks or general appearance I'm Middle Eastern, I'm Iranian specifically, and my family immigrated to the United States when I was two years old, so in 1986. For folks who don't know, um, Iran's history in the mid 70s onward was very, very turbulent. And I'm not gonna go down a history rabbit hole here, Taylor, like that's a, that's a you thing, but um, it's important for the context of setting this up, uh, what was yeah. going on. But the TLDR is that Iran was basically a secular country for most of its history. It was a constitutional monarchy leading up to the revolution in 1979. With that revolution, the leadership and institutions that were ushered in were focused primarily around Islam and forcing a strict moral code on people, which is mm -hmm. where we're at now. So if you follow right. the news even a little bit, that's why women are protesting why they can't go see soccer matches or why they have to keep their hair in a, I don't know what you call it, the, the hijab. Hijab. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know, there's constant protests that are immediately followed by executions because that's a kind of right. But and also, of course, it's dealing with his dog. But it's not just um, going to soccer games wearing the hijab. It's like they can't go to the doctor unless the doctor's a woman. But also, women can't be doctors. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's you know I put this within the context so I could actually have folks try to conceptualize what this actually means because that's how quickly things shifted in in Iran specifically was seventy nine. It happened like you are living one way again. It's a, it was mm -hmm. a secular country. The Shah, mm -hmm. there was no uh, auspices of religion there. So to put it in context, imagine you're living your cool hip life in LA or New York, going out with your friends, meeting people. And then one day you have police telling you to stop holding hands with your partner, that mm -hmm. all the places that you socialize are shut down. Like that's how stark and different things ended up being, which is, you know, like, again, like I have a point to all this. But think about what happens to those people who are like, no, I'm not going right. to live like that. Like all the cool people leave, right? Like all the mm -hmm. ones who are not insane religious zealots leave mm -hmm. because, or, mm -hmm. well, then if the ones who have the opportunity to, right? They have the resources. Right, the ones that can. Mm -hmm. So, and that's exactly what my family did, right? They, they were like, mm -hmm. they made a decision that we do not want to be religious zealots. So mm -hmm. we are going to leave, and that's what we did, and that's how we ended up in Texas. So the reason I'm bringing all of this up is because, as I mentioned, the start of this story resonates with me because it is about someone trying to escape their home country for a better life. Mm -hmm. But this story also enrages me because of what one member of this family ends up doing. Okay. I am going to shit on religion a little bit. On this. We've never done that before, Farz. That's totally up, off character. Yeah, it's totally off show. brand for me. Yeah. It will be a thousand percent justified every time I do it. <laughs> so I'm 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 gonna keep going on this rant because I'm like riled up now and this has nothing to do with what's in the outline. It's do. If you come to the United States for a better life because you're trying to escape things that are going on in your home country, mm -hmm. don't try to make this like your home country. Right. If you're already decided, like, I left something bad, don't bring that bad with you. Yeah, it has nothing to do with assimilation. Really, like, yeah. maintain your language, maintain your religion, maintain your whatever, but don't be the thing that you needed to escape for a better life. Mm -hmm. That's my general thesis to anybody who is, you know, over here from a different country. Anyways, whatever. I'm, I'm going to keep, I'm going to get into more rants later. <laughs> no, totally. I want to, I want to know more because I'm also curious is like, is that, how hard is that to do? Well, I, I, I actually do put that in the outline. I actually discuss a piece of this in the outline because I think that there's mm -hmm. a point in time when you have to decide at, at what point do you have to diverge from your cultural understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. And there's going to come a point in time when this guy could have done it and he didn't do it. Um, and totally. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to point that out. I'm going to put, put a punctuation point on that. So the person we're discussing is a guy named Yasser. Abdul Sayed. Mm -hmm. Master is from Egypt and he came to the US at 26 years old. 
Uh, he did it for exactly the same reason anybody does it. It's for opportunity. Uh, specifically, he was here to pursue higher education because in those countries, like it's, I'm not going to keep going down that ramp. Like it is impossible to get like a decent education there if you're not like the 1.001% of smartest people in the country, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yasser married a, an American woman named Patricia when he was 30 and she was 15, which Taylor, oh. we've learned a lot about oh, no. this dynamic. How, how they meet i actually don't know how they met but i would say that not at a bar definitely or at, not a bar yeah. on tinder but i would say that um i, I discuss patricia sparingly here because I, I mean i hate to be mean about it but like she just seems like a nothing like she just seems like a nothing mm. person like it, like just like an empty vessel basically that sucks so the two of them would go on to have three kids. They have a son named Islam, who was born in 1988, a daughter named Amina, born in 89, and another daughter named Sarah, who was born in 90. So three kids. Okay. To say Yasser was controlling is a bit of an understatement. He had an almost abnormal predilection to know exactly what his daughters were doing at any given point in time. By all accounts, this behavior did not extend to Islam. He really didn't give a shit what the son was doing got it this is yeah yes exactly uh and this is where my speculation is going to come a bit into play there aren't i've watched a lot of news shows about what goes on here i've read a lot about Mm -hmm. it but it's not a super meaty topic um people we don't go into a ton of details about the inner workings of these this family or the news doesn't really go into the inner workings of this family very much so there's gonna be some speculation here because again i feel a little bit like it's appropriate for me to talk on it given that it's a yeah. eastern guy and i've like I, i'm we'll, we'll get into it so part of the speculation is i'm assuming and i think correctly that part of why he really didn't care about islam the son i'm just gonna call him the son, son because it's confusing yeah versus a daughter is is really religion it's cultural Mm -hmm. i think yasser came up in an islamic household and in a country where women just aren't seen as equal to men he doesn't have to keep tabs on the son because the son probably he in his mind he knows what's up it's the girls you got to keep tabs on right per usual i hate making excuses for this type of behavior but I feel like if you've lived in that environment for 26 years, breaking that programming has to be hard. Yes, totally. I That's what I was thinking, yeah. I referenced this a little bit earlier about like where that divergence happens. I think in any situation, a person who has been programmed by life or culture or whatever it is, comes to a certain point and then has to make a decision. Go with the programming or break the cycle. Mm-hmm. That, that is an inflection point I think happens again as as an immigrant like i can speak with some knowledge of that like there you reach a point where you're like uh this is what i know this is how i was raised what do you do what what path do you take here yasser is going to take the exact wrong path and we're going to see that happen here in a moment so going back to the two daughters there were reports of abuse of course there was some physical abuse and by some accounts sexual abuse as well i won't go into them but Mostly it's because that's not the interesting part of this story. The interesting mm-hmm. part is the extent to which Yasser wanted to control the daughters. He almost sounds like a jealous ex-boyfriend. Mm. Like he'd go Like through, you belong to me. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. 100%. He'd go through their phone. He would record them without their knowledge to see what they were talking about. And in particular, he had an extreme aversion to them. I mean, really just growing up in dating boys that's what it was Mm -hmm. yeah the latter part the dating boys part seems to be the biggest trigger for yasser there were multiple stories and accounts of these um this understanding that yasser was very violent can you hear that your dog yeah i can kind of hear it but i I barely i don't think anyone's gonna be able to hear it they might think it's farts though which we've heard you've heard that feedback your brother is so wrong. Like, he, he, <laughs> if he re-listens to it, I don't even know how you would make that sound. That like the pitch of it is obviously the, the yelp of a dog. <laughs> you heard that? You heard? You hear that, Kincaid? Talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, so like I said, with 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 Yasser, the trigger with him was really like the girls and their relationship with with boys. 
Mm-hmm. He did one of these gross old guy things that was just all about like protecting the virtue of his daughters. Ew. There's one story about how when Amina turned 16, Yasser took her to Egypt to marry a friend of his, which at this point, Yasser's 48. So how old is this Ew. friend who's marrying a 16 year old? Also, these girls were born in the United States. They're born in Texas. Like, right? They, you know what? I'm getting flashbacks to that family, um, the one with the dad who looks like Harry from Dumb and Dumber, where it's like where you have exposure mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to the real world, and then now you're going to Egypt to marry some guy and be in this like Islamic family. Like, it, I don't know. It, it's, right. It sounds awful. Yeah. Obviously, the more he pushed the girls in the way that he pushed them, the more he repelled them. So Amina starts dating a boy she meets in a karate class. They would have to use code words and stuff to get around Yasser's surveillance, which Mm -hmm. just shows really the unflappable resolve of a teenage boy dating a girl. I know, poor guy. Seriously, poor guy. At one (laughs) point, Yasser suspected that she was dating someone and beat the shit out of her to try and get her to tell her him the boy's name. She took the beating. She refused to give the boy's name because she legitimately thought he would kill him if she did. Wow. Yeah. And again, constant theme that I read over and over again was like, yeah, the mom thought that he was going to kill them. He was going to kill her. Like, constantly. It comes up over and over again. The mom just, yeah, like, she just seemed like maybe resigned it was um, to it? resigned to but- it. That, that's probably the right. I, I shouldn't talk bad about her. Like, I think that she was just so beaten down by this guy that she was just like whatever whatever happens yeah why i mean like i don't i'm so sorry but i don't understand why he's so mad because he wants to like he wants them to just completely be controlled by him then like why even send them to school okay why send you to karate class so that so that's the thing like that's why i i mean i hate to say it this way i know this guy Mm -hmm. like i grew up with guys like this um mm. i'm not gonna go into details because it'll be obvious to people who hear this story you know me like what i'm talking about <laughs> but <laughs> but there's something about this cultural grip that when some people just can't handle it like it's mm-hmm. it's almost like a known thing when you come to america that like if you're from one of these countries it's almost known that some people just can't take it that it's yeah. too much stimulation too much going on I, mm-hmm. I think that he just falls in this category. I think I don't think that it was like a, I'm so mad thing. I think it's like a I'm just out of my element thing. Totally. Yeah, I definitely don't understand that, so I appreciate that perspective because I don't get it. Yeah, it's a thing. It really is. Um yeah. so that relationship with Amina progressed to the point where her and the boy actually got engaged. Aww. Which to me is just cutesy teenage bullshit. He probably got her a totally. ring out of one of those gumball machines, you know. Garbled. By some accounts um, that I actually couldn't verify, the other daughter, Sarah, had also started dating someone and also got secretly engaged. To me, the girls at this point, as I was reading this, it sounded like they were just trying to find any exit, any way to flee. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure those boys were, like, very, I don't know, like, brave and, like, comforting, you know? They'd be like, we're gonna, it's going to be okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm going to take us on a bit of a side quest here. Taylor, have you heard of the concept of honor killings before? Yes. I think that's when, like, a dad kills their daughter to stop her from doing something that would dishonor the family. Like, yeah, that that, that's roughly it. So I I I did put a little bit of facts together here. So I did a bit of research on this, and several things I found will probably shock no one. Again, I'm not trying to shit on religion or the ethnicity but obviously this is something that happens in middle eastern cultures <laughs> like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't, that's not prejudice or racist for me to say that is actually what ends up happening mm-hmm. so i remember taylor when i was around 16 years old i found this book at the library because i used to actually read that was called the stoning of soraya m and because yeah. it was um framed as like a iranian book it was it, it is it's about an iranian woman I picked it up because I was just like trying to learn more about like Iran and what goes on there. Yeah. And I was 16 and I thought, okay, let's see what this is all about. It's the true story of a woman named Soraya in a village in Iran whose husband wanted to marry someone new, but didn't want to return her dowry or support two families at the same time. So he spread mm-hmm. a rumor that she was having an affair. So the village and her own family would agree to kill her by stoning her to death. That's exactly what happened to Anne Boleyn. 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He wanted to marry someone else. Yes. So he accused her of having an affair and had her killed. Yeah, con- yeah. I guess I guess this is more common than it probably should be. I put this part in. I literally wrote this is for Juan because he asked for more gruesomeness. So in a stoning, mm-hmm. what ends up happening is the victim is buried in the ground up to their neck and people just take <gasps> turns throwing stones at their head. In Soraya's case, it was documented that her father had to start the process. He was the first one to throw the stone, followed by her son, and then followed by the guy they made up the story about that she was cheating on her husband with. He didn't get killed. Like, that guy was fine, but he did have to also throw rocks at this woman's head. But they all, like, knew that it was a lie. The husband knew it was a lie, and this guy knew it was a lie, Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but apparently when it was his turn, uh, he was supposed to throw a few, and I guess he threw one, and he just picked up the other stone and was disgusted and just threw it away and walked away. He just couldn't do it. Oh, how brave. I know, yeah. So, super awful story, and also surprisingly not uncommon. The vast majority of honor killings are women and girls, as you stated, with the exception of men really being homosexuality, or mm-hmm. if they're caught, you know, diddling a kid or a family member or something like that. Mm-hmm. The UN estimates that about 5,000 of these killings occur annually. Ugh. And as the name implies, and as you also mentioned, the killing is meant as a way to restore the family name when someone is perceived to have dishonored it. Mm-hmm. So I did a lot more research on this. Don't need to go into details. The one thing I would note is that the Quran actually itself does not reference or bring up the concept of death for mm. the sake of honor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it is what it is. It's, it's a weird thing because I feel like there's no like in my family there's no like dishonor the family thing, you know. Like it just sounds something that we like think of. Like I mean, are... look, look, I can I can feel this even from my perspective of like you know having to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer mm-hmm. or like it's it's like it's it's a no like if you weren't then that is a dishonorable like it's yeah. a thing it really is. Totally. So going back to our story. These girls are basically constantly plotting their escape with the boyfriends, which is why they're getting engaged anyways. And Yasser is a constant terror to be around. And on January 1, 2008, he tells the girls to get into the taxi cab he drives for work so that they can all go get someone to eat. Mm-hmm. They, by all accounts, they do not want to do this. They, they are terrified of this guy at this point. Mm-hmm. He drives them to a parking lot of a hotel in a part of Dallas, which I'm actually like really, really familiar with. My mom used to work like right here. It's called um, it's this part of Dallas called Las Colinas, and he parked mm-hmm. his cab at the Omni Hotel there. After which, he promptly turned to the girls who were in the back seat and shot them. Oh, Amina I died. So scared. Yeah, Amina died. Yeah, I actually talked about that here in a sec. Amina died instantly. Sarah actually lived long enough to call the police, call 911, and explicitly said that her dad shot her. Oh, my God. In total, he shot off 11 bullets. Wow. Which, like, in the, in the back seat in the of the car? car. Yeah. I mean, I've been gun shooting, and I've had, like, the headphones on. It is deafening with that situation, much less in the in a, inside of a car. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, Amina died right away. It was actually Sarah who took the brunt of it because he... How old uh, How old were they? I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, I should know that. I don't know. Hold on. So, this, like happened in two, this happened in 2008. Amina was 89 and Sarah was 90. So, Sarah Sarah would have been 18. Uh, yeah, Sarah would have been 18 and Amina would have been two year, or a year older than that. So, 19. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So... Like I said, Amina died right away. It was Sarah who took the brunt. She took nine shots and then also oh survived for a little bit. Going back to my side quest, um, this is classic honor killing to the mm-hmm. T. It's actually how the police also defined it. He did this because the girls were dating American boys and he couldn't handle it. Because in his <sighs> mind and based on his behavior, they were his property and he chose who they should be married to, which right. again was like a mid- 40s man in Egypt. Yeah. And when Did I said, he want them to live in Egypt? Yeah. Yeah. After, even though after he'd left. Yeah. Okay. Which, like, I mean, to his credit, good for self awareness of knowing that you probably don't belong living here. Like, it's this is not your vibe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when I said earlier that there's an inflection point 
whether you go to your programming or you alternate, mm-hmm. this is that moment. This is the time when you decide upon self-reflection, my, I got to find a way to be cool with my daughters dating these guys mm-hmm. and move beyond it. Mm-hmm. Or go to my programming. My programming is telling me I got to kill them. Like, right. That was the decision point that he chose to go this route. Mm-hmm. Which, again, I would say in any situation, most people come to this country in an immigrant capacity. You probably experience that in a much less severe way. But mm-hmm. it is it is relatively common. Yeah, that makes sense. So like I said, this all happened at the very, very start. It was Jan 1 of 2008. From that day until August of 2017, so just shy of 10 years, nobody heard or saw anything of Yasser. What? Yeah, he just kind of vanished. They actually thought that he went back to Egypt, but they couldn't find any records of it. He walked away from the car. He got out of the car after he shot them, and (gasps) poof, that was it. Wow. Yasser also has the unique distinction of having been placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list in 2014. Wow. Yeah, I actually used the Wayback Machine to figure out who else he was on the list with, which is like, yeah. he was on the list with some crazy, crazy people. He was on a list with this guy who was a cartel guy who was like a captain in some cartel. Like he was uh-huh. big enough to where he was one of those guys who would like get plastic surgery done on his face so that nobody could recognize him, which is insane. Insane level of like, okay. to- yeah. there was another guy who was on the list who killed his wife, killed his two kids, then blew up their house that they lived in in Scottsdale, which... I mean, don't do that again, but good. Like, the flair for theatrics is kind of appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite guy that he's on the list with is this guy named Semyon Mogolevich, who the U.S. government describes as the most powerful and dangerous gangster in the world. He's basically the head of the Russian mafia. I yeah, mean, not if, cool. That's terrible. But no, it actually cool. is super cool. You should read this guy's <laughs> Wikipedia page. His aliases alone are like, several paragraphs long what's his name again i'm gonna type it down semion is s-e-m-i-o-n oh he came up right away semion mcgulovich criminal it says yeah nice. okay he, i'll read this one we're done it is his life is so i i, I wrote this i wrote this that at some point if we ever start covering just like random people that we find interesting i 100 percent am gonna do this guy because it is like he sounds like a fictional john woo character like, he oh sounds God, like really? he belongs in all the Wick movies. It's it's fascinating. So, okay. But, but the, just so you, everybody knows, like, that's the caliber of people that he's on this list with in 2014. Wow. So, going back to Yasser. In 2014, his dumbass son rents an apartment in his own name in Texas. The son was obviously trying to protect his dad. So, when police showed up to interview his I, mean, I wrote Islam, but I'm just going to call him the son because it's confusing. Mm-hmm. They showed up to interview with the son. He was just very defensive and uncooperative. So somebody had mentioned that they saw a figure inside this house because everybody's looking for this guy. They've been looking for for like 10 years at this point. Right, and it makes sense that he would still talk to his son because he like care of the son. Yeah, yeah, 100%. The son was protecting him mm-hmm. throughout this whole thing. Oh, what a dick. So please show up, talk to him. The son gives them nothing. Overnight, whoever was in that apartment disappeared. The, the FBI showed up the next day, they broke in, and they just, nobody was there. The FBI found a pair of eyeglasses, and they used this thing called DNA kinship analysis, which means they built a DNA profile of Yasser by, like, reverse engineering it. So, essentially, they took dried blood from the girls, which they had. They took an mm-hmm. oral swab of Patricia, which they had, and they created mm-hmm. a DNA profile of Yasser. And they mm-hmm. conclusively determined that the eyeglasses were his. So, they knew he was in the area. They knew that someone was protecting him. So that's would, a lot of information. Go ahead. Sorry. No, how about what? How, how do you get your DNA from your glasses? I guess, like, maybe if there's like a thing of hair or dandruff on there. I don't know. I don't know that's how this works. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how any of this works. This happens, but then nothing happens again. It'll be another six years before the authorities catch wind of where these guys are again. And they see Islam, again, the son, and yeah. his uncle. Just name your kids something different. Like, Christians, well, I mean, Islam's, like, like, yeah, the Christian. I feel like we t- we accept that as being a name, but when you like think about it more than four seconds, you're like, that's a weird ass name. Yeah, like I'm not gonna name my son Protestant boy. Like, yeah. why 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 are we cool? Anyways, whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. No, no, totally. So, 
Um, they spot the son with his uncle. So Yasser's brother is also a part of this dynamic and helping them out. Mm-hmm. And they're going in and out of a house in um, a part of town called Louisville. The FBI gets a warrant and enters the house. They find and finally arrest Yasser. Wow. They also arrest the brother, or the, sorry, the son and Yasser's brother the same day for aid, aiding and abetting a fugitive. Yasser went on trial actually just last year. It's very recent. Wow. This all happened in 2008. He just went on trial a year ago. Wow. His absolutely inscrutable defense is that someone was threatening him and his daughters in the cab that day. And so he parked the cab and walked away, leaving his daughters alone with this person who was a threat to them because he thought that the guy was after him and not the daughters. That that was his argument. That's his defense. That the guy would, like, follow him? Yeah. The guy would person? follow him and not the daughters. Oh, my God. That's dumb and not true. Yeah, the jury took three hours to deliberate, which I'm shocked at this. Be- like, I was like, I wrote down, they must have had like a two and a half hour lunch break. And that exactly. counted as part of the deliberation. Like, I have no idea how this would take you three hours to figure out. So Yasser, unsurprisingly, gets life, a life sentence without the possibility of parole. He's incarcerated at this place that sounds really charming. It's called B County. It's very, very, mm-hmm. very nice name. Yasser's son also gets seven years and his brother gets 12 years and they arguably got it a little bit worse since they're actually in federal prison there goes that he took a lot of people down with him I want to circle back to the topic of our show and what it means here and what it means again to me personally like I said before I grew up with guys like this. Like, I understand yeah. guys like this. And like I said, I can literally think of three men off the top of my head that obviously didn't take it this far, but were con- in need of control and possession more than mm-hmm. would be acceptable in modern society. And I wrote down here, you know, all this is culturally informed while living in a culture that doesn't adhere to those beliefs, which I think is where that juxtaposition happens on someone's mind, which is like, how do I reconcile that Mm -hmm. i would say this if you're dating someone whose background is historically on the extreme conservative side of things pay attention Mm -hmm. to things if a guy tells you what to wear how to act that's not something that's going to wash away by you asking him to chill that's Mm -hmm. entrenched programming it's not look uh, this isn't like uh, look i've been framing this as like a middle eastern thing it's not even really that like it's think about the entire middle of this country think about the hardcore conservative guys who I mean, those are also a demographic like this that don't want women to show their faces, right? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I would just say, like, again, going back to the topic of this show, like, pay attention to this stuff. Like, it's Mm -hmm. it has consequences. Obviously, Patricia divorced him in 2009 after the murders, but, like, wow, whatever. Like, she didn't really help her daughter. She didn't really protect them, and I don't think she really had the wherewithal to do that anyways. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah and like yeah there's like a weird thing in in like conservative christianity where there's like the purity thing with your dad where you like so weird you know go to like a a purity ball and like promise to remain pure until you marry which is so stupid and like not real um it's so creepy i so again like i I was raised in texas and like mm -hmm. i knew kids growing up where like they're going to a dance with their dads to talk it's all centered around your virginity. Like, it, yeah. Do y'all not so, think that's weird? So weird. Anyways, yeah. It's so weird. It's weird to think that much about your. Yeah, it's weird. I don't. So I don't weird. know. And I think that. That, but I think it goes back to something that we said a bunch is like controlling women, for whatever reason you feel like you have to. Yeah. Or yeah. Controlling other people. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's my story. Luckily, this guy's in jail. He's gonna be in jail for the rest of his life. Um, I went down so many side quests on this one. What was the what's the is the doomed part? The trying to move your culture into another culture. It's so much of it. Like it's it's yeah. it's just go back to Egypt, man. Like yeah, just go back to Egypt. Like you'll find a nice girl there. You'll get married, and she won't show her face. Like I like just she'll your kids will adopt that as their personas like i don't know why you have to do that here mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So that's a part of it. And the other part is obviously the marriage of Patricia, where again, I don't, I don't, I'm going to sing a swan, swan song for her, but she sounds like she just had literally no power or control to do anything. And yeah. I think that's the age difference. I think that some people frame their culture as this incredibly, incredibly important thing. I remember I had this conversation. So I, I had this friend, I'm like, I'm bring up exactly how I know him because again it's going to give up too many details but this friend Uh he's a white guy um and him and his girlfriend went to Spain and they went to like the bull show the running of the bulls right Uh uh-huh and they recorded this and they played me this video of it and they were just like we just have to honor their culture I'm like no you don't this is fucking savage this is like fuck their culture like this whole excuse of like it's my culture i'm so vehemently against that because like Mm -hmm. culture just because you were raised in a certain way doesn't mean that's how it should be basically right totally so yeah i think like in this case it's like i think that part of it is patricia was again trying to be super chill and was like i'm not raised in a very in-depth culture so i don't know how it is so this must be how it is it's like yeah, you can also call that out. You can also be like, yeah, actually, fuck that part of your culture. It's stupid. We should abandon that. Yeah. But that's like, then there's so many, so many people who are so like violently obsessed with their culture, which is like all this stuff that's happening in the Middle East right now because it's, they're like, this yeah. is, and like, who's to say, like, you're like, there's like a, I don't want to say like who's right and who's wrong, but I also want to be like, I do believe it's wrong to not let women outside. <laughs> there's a thing that um, Iranians do that i am going to uh, the next generation i'm going to change the tide of us doing this completely it's called taro thing which is Mm -hmm. you constantly are trying to like get people to like you're trying to offer them things in a way that's just absolutely annoying like imagine (laughs) sitting at a dinner table and Mm -hmm. every two minutes your grandma or a relative is just like have you tried that salad? It's really good. You should try the salad. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Like two minutes later, have you tried that? It's really good. You should. Try it. It's like what? Just leave me alone. Or, or the worst <laughs> is when you go out to dinner, and it's just like everybody just like tries to shove their credit card at the waiter, and like mm-hmm. I stopped even trying when I'm in those situations. Like, dude, whatever. Like, take it. Like, it's fine. Like, I'm not even like if this is how you want to live. Like, we could just split it. We could just have be normal people and split. But, anyways. but whatever. Let them pay. Who that's cares? a cultural thing that Iranians do just absolutely drive me nuts. So, anyways, um, yeah, that's sort of... well, that was terrible. Those poor girls. Yeah, no kidding. That's they had the boyfriends. They had no idea what they were signing up for. I know that's that's a lot. Like for those those kids, they were just kids and probably like you know loved their cute little girlfriends who were just like they're just normal. You know, they could have been like I don't know, cute little happy. Th- and also, Patricia is white. Yeah, which I feel like I'm just I'm finding on Google, and so like, yeah, they it wasn't like I don't know. That's too bad. That's really sad, and it's definitely like I wonder what he did for those years that he was on the run. Yeah, yeah, I think his son supported him, his brother supported him. I have no idea. And what but... a way to like. I I know that we've we've definitely talked about the hot take of don't kill your family. <laughs> hot take, don't kill your family. But you can also, like you said, freaking leave them. Yeah. just leave them just you will go. also never talk to them again just just go go somewhere else go to egypt like you said like just leave so many right. people so many yeah. people have multiple families yeah. just have your just family here you got it out of your system who cares leave yeah. them go to egypt leave them. yeah you can pretend they're dead say they're dead to me get out of here who cares you know but they don't have to actually kill them i feel like That's we're horrible. just like we're just like therapists for psychopaths at this point I just, I mean, we have so many good ideas, which are like, don't kill people. Have you worked on- Don't believe on, in wizards. Have you worked your on your- Your eyes are not the window to the soul. Have you worked, I disagreed. Have you worked more on your um, dating app for widows yet? No, widow, widow or won't you? Um, no, but I think it still is a top priority for me because I think it's 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 a gold mine. Widows, um, I mean, how many widows- how many widows. widows are there in the world? In their 20s are there in the U.S. Uh, love and loss. No older adults. What percentage of widows are under 40? Oh, 5%. Okay, that's not great. 
that great. Yeah, we're not gonna, we're not, my Moo Moo idea was the right idea. That's what we actually should have done. Okay, this is maybe my second, second plan. Is it my widow or will But yeah, I mean, I think also like there's a lot of people in the world. So go find someone else if you feel like killing your partner. No big deal. There's more people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm a, I think I've shown that I'm a firm, staunch supporter of not murdering partners. Cool. Um, um, can you also, when you, when we when we're done, listen to the the disco hit, the rest of the Rasputin, where it goes rah rah Rasputin. Have you heard that song? No. Look, we'll we'll look. I'll put that in the in some notes as well because you should listen to that after. Love it. Um. Cool. Well, that's our cool. story, Taylor. Thanks for sharing yours. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hopefully, you have a lovely weekend in Joshua Tree. Thank you. You too. And um, I will. Yeah, thank you everyone for for listening and subscribing. Please give us those reviews and email us at doomedafellpod at gmail.com if you have any ideas, questions. Yes, all of it. Thanks everyone. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.